So let's get into Perpetual and Felicity. First note, during the time of Perpetual and Felicity, the emperor at that time, his name was Septimius Cer Cerberus. Septimius Cerberus. Septimius Cerberus was a fighting emperor. He was not an emperor who just sat in his ivory towers. He actually was a soldier. Prior to even becoming emperor, he was a fighter. Once he became emperor, he was very generous to the Roman soldiers. You guys know how today, regardless of what side of the aisle you sit on, there are certain administrations when they become presidential administrations, the expense on the defense budget just skyrockets, right? They just, you can tell that they are pro-military. Money just goes to the military. The same thing has happened here. Severus was a military guy. When he became emperor, he raised the salary of soldiers 67%. Which means if you raise the salary of soldiers 67%, that means everybody got taxed that much more. He provided so many resources to the military during his time that it was, <laughs> let's just say the recruiters had it easy, they had it easy. It was literally a promising career. And it was a promising path to a measure of wealth because when they retired, they were given, first of all, if they weren't Roman citizens, they were given Roman citizenship. They were given land, they were given households, the slaves. I mean, it was, it was a nice way to, to, to move on up, okay? In addition to, um, I guess you wanna say, helping out the economic situation of the military and the military men, Rome had this, as we know, this pantheon of gods. You guys remember the Persian god I mentioned, Mithras? Um, Mithra became the preeminent god of the Roman pantheon during um, Severus's reign. Why? Because the deity was popular among the military. Mithras was the sun god. which incidentally remained popular all the way up through the time of Constantine, which made it easy for certain traditions that we'll get into um, between the pagans and the Christians to, to sink. As Mithras was born on December 25th, it was the worship of the sun. He rose in the east. Okay. And the sun, during the spring solstice, they worship the sun because it was resurrected. It was no longer winter, so the days got longer. Okay. It was during that season. So, um, as you can see, some things started to sink together. This all started with Severus. Um, now, during his reign, early on in his reign, he was not um hostile to christians in fact he had members of his household who were christian and the nurse who looked over his children was a christian nurse however for some reason we do not know why about i don't know 10 years into his reign as emperor so we're talking now 202 he issued an edict that forbade conversions to Judaism and Christianity. So he didn't have an edict against Christians, per se. He didn't have an edict, uh, edict against 
Jews per se, he had an edict against the conversion. We don't know why. We don't know why he had this hang up on um, persons converting from pagan faith traditions to either Judaism or Christianity. Some speculate maybe he had a close associate who converted and then stopped participating in something. Right? Couldn't go to the club no more because you're a Christian now, right? So now I hate all everybody, everybody who switches, right? Y'all messing my game up. We don't know what was going on. Something happened that made him not like the conversion process. As a result of the edict, a persecution followed. Now I want to point out something. I want to point it out in perpetual for this. I think I said this Monday. I didn't, I should have. There's only one time, and it's not this time, there's only one time that there was an empire-wide persecution against Christians. That doesn't happen so much later. 249. All other edicts that went against Christianity, even though the edict that went out there, it really was enforced by the local governors, not the empire, and not the emperor. And the same thing is here. I mean, how was the emperor supposed to know every single time somebody converts? It's not even, it's not even logical. However, the local governors, if it was an issue in their local area, they would conveniently use the edict to say, oh, now I have a reason to round up me some, some Christians. Let's use this. Right? And get now, remember who they're rounding up is those who convert. Right? In this, in this edict. There had to be usually some type of stimulus is the reason why they went locally, began to go after um, the Christians. This persecution that followed was especially heavy in North Africa, which is where Perpetua and Felicity and their friends were. It also is where um, Tertullian was in this area of North Africa, which is the reason why some believe that Tertullian is the one who wrote uh, what you're reading about the Petra and Felicity. Others that, just so you know, others that, that died, these are names that we're going to be talking about during Severus's reign is St. Clement of Alexandria. And the father of a man named Origen. Origen, one of his readings is actually the reading that on Christ. Origen's father. Origen did not, was not murdered, even though he tried to be murdered. Uh, matter of fact, when his father was martyred, um, he wanted to be there, but he couldn't because his mother didn't want her baby to be martyred. So when he got up to leave the house, she hid his clothes. Seriously, hid his clothes. He was like, I can't go out naked. Where my clothes at? Mm, I don't know your clothes at. You ain't going today. <laughs> you ain't going today. So he was not able to go, um, which, one second, which leads to what you're going to read on Friday, which is his exhortation for martyrdom. It led him to write um, this exhortation to martyrdom. In other words, we need to be we need to desire, we as Christians, need to desire to be blessed, to be put in a pet place, to be a witness. So, so we're reading that on Friday and not before Friday? It's for Friday. Okay. It's for Friday. All right. Any questions? Let's get into, yes. 202. 202. 202. 203. All right, so let's get into Perpetua and Felicity. The story that you have, even though there's only three voices, there are actually um, four, no, five, five individuals involved in this account. 
there were four slaves, Revocatus, Saturnus, Sapundulus, and Felicity. So there were four slaves who were all arrested together and one noble woman, which was perpetual. Perpetua, as I mentioned, was from a noble family. Interestingly, she was married, but her husband does not, and I, I'm gonna point out why this is significant, but her husband is not mentioned anywhere in the account, which means one of two things. Well, most theologian historians believe it means one of two things. Either her husband was arrested as well, and he just isn't mentioned, which means he was part of this whole journey to martyrdom, or he had passed away. The reason why is because of the, the father's actions, and I'll talk about that later on. We know she was married, but we don't know why the husband is not mentioned or involved at all in the She clearly demonstrates, perpetual zone is still what I'm talking about. She clearly demonstrates a zealous attachment to Christianity, but this text doesn't explain why. There's no reason for the motivation. We know she converts, because she converts in the story, but we don't know why the zeal is there up until death. There is some speculation in North Africa, particularly in Carthage. We know from both reading Tertullian's work and eventually what happened to Tertullian, that there was a movement, a Christian movement that was taking place at that time called Montanism, Montanism. It's called Montanism because it was started by this guy named Montanus, which makes sense, right. Montanism. Remember, there is no universal, well, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> I'm gonna say something real heretical. Uh, there is no institution of the church yet, okay? You've got Christian communities littered about, but there is no unifying structure. So at the time, Montanism wouldn't have been seen as anything heretical. It just would have been seen as a Christian movement within the Christian community. Montanism um, believed in, to use today's term, it was a charismatic movement. They believed in receiving new revelation beyond scripture inspired by the Holy Spirit. They firmly believed that Jesus was going to return like tomorrow. They always lived in expectation that he was coming the next day, like literally, he coming tomorrow. You need to be ready. So they lived a very austere, Holy life. One of the distinctiveness is they believe that everything in the material world, not that it was bad, but that it had nowhere near the value of living life in expectation of Jesus. Like you, you should be willing to give anything away that you need to give away to stay living in that austere, always prepared lifestyle. The reason why I bring this up is because Perpetua is actually showing signs of being influenced by that line of thought because she is ready to give up anything, everything um, to, <clears throat> I, 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 
if you want to call it, to, to in anticipation of Christ. Not that she was a Montanist, but you can clearly tell that that, that line of thought was very influential and very a part of Christian thought in North Africa. The text that you were given to read, the editor, if it's Tertullian, whoever the editor is, he points out very early on, there are two reasons why martyrdom literature is repeated. Number one, because martyr is a witness, the more you talk about the martyrs' lives, just talk about their lives, gives a witness to Jesus, gives a witness to God's grace. So simply, if you don't have anything else, this is a way to put it, if you don't have anything else to say, to share the faith tradition, tell the story of a martyr, because their life is a witness. That's one of the reasons why. You, you, you uh, use these as illustrations of true faith. The second reason, not only are you giving a witness to the life of Christ, to God's grace, but to those who are already believers, you are giving edification. You're giving um, comfort. You're giving comfort to those who are enduring any type of suffering or persecution, which tells me, or shouldn't say tells me, tells theologian historians that these are written down purposely to be talked about not just during the persecution, but even after, right? So these were written purposely and shared to, for the next generation. Because remember, in their mindset, again, the persecution against Christians went up and down. Sometimes it was high, sometimes it was nothing going on. So these were written for when the time does hit, you've got something to fall back on. In addition to scripture, in addition to the story of Jesus, you've got something that happened a little bit closer to time in your own neighborhoods, right? That will also give you comfort. With some of them, I'll say again, with some of them rising to the top, that we're still talking about the 1800s. So in a sense, even today, amongst the various traditions within the Christian tradition, this, this, these stories of martyrdom um, still elicit hope. One thing I want you to realize recognize early on in the text it talks about that perpetua was under house arrest early on did anybody catch when did she go to jail anybody see when did she actually go to jail she was first under house arrest what took place and then she went to jail marissa that tells us something about the way the outside world saw Christians, it tells us a little bit something about the way the Christian community saw those who I kind of call that in-between stage. To the Roman authorities, to the outside world, the pagan world, what was a clear act that identified you as Christians? How did they know? Yeah. Baptism. So baptism was a definitive act that was a visible um, symbol of where your allegiance was. Prior to baptism, if you were associated with the Christian community, so in this case, this he, Talarian is his name, the governor, I'll, I'll show you why he did it, but he's using the emperor's edict if you are being assumed or is alleged 
that you are in the process of conversion, you're not put in jail because you ain't a Christian yet. Conversion doesn't take place until baptism. But if you're associated with them, you're going to be under house arrest. You're being, you under speculation. We watching. Okay. That tells us something about the early church community. There must have been some type of process for moving from being unbeliever to believer. So in other words, it's not just, I'm going to get baptized today and I'm a Christian today. There had to be some process enough to where you're making changes that you're not Christian yet because you ain't been baptized, but you're making changes enough to be identified that you're associated with them. So much so that we at least gonna put you under house arrest. Right? We know, even though it's not written here, we know what that means. This process had to be over a long period of time. Today, in the Catholic tradition, who knows what the process is called if you want to convert? If you're an adult and you want to convert, what's it called? Anybody know? Hmm? RCIA. Does anybody know what RCIA stands for? Rights of Christian Initiation as an Adult, for an adult. For an adult. So, into technically, everybody, everybody's RCA program is not equal. Some are better than others. However, it's supposed to be from the beginning of the liturgical year, which is in September, all the way through to the Easter vigil, a person is in formation. Okay? Which, depending on the year, depends on how long that span of time is. You go through a period of inquiry. And then you become a catechumen if you haven't been baptized. If you've been baptized before in another tradition, you become a canon. Point is, it's a process. We'll say seven month process. Before the fourth century, it was a lot longer than that. It would take it would be years right? before you would move from being an unbeliever to a uh, Christian, the act of baptism. But for our sake of history, we know from this, so this was written in the second century. We know that at least in the second century, there was a process. There was some cate catechesis that was taking place, some process from conversion. Right? That was part of the theological process at the time. And she's jailed after becoming um, Christian, it also lets us know with this theology of martyrdom from the very beginning, part of being a Christian is the expectation and almost the desire to want to go to martyrdom. Because the edict is happening. They're saying, if you convert, you're going to jail, you're going to be killed. And she did it anyway. So that means that it was part of her. She, okay, this is, this is working for me. This is the goal anyway. I'm, they would have, she literally would have thought, I am in luck. Praise be to God, I'm coming into the faith while an edict is being enforced. She'd be running towards it. Can't wait. Right. In her vision, she has two visions that it talks about. In her first vision, which has this vision of a ladder to heaven, where she meets her brother, which I'm going to talk about in a moment. But her brother, in this vision, says to her that you are greatly privileged. Why? Because she's about to go to jail. That's not something you would normally hear from your relatives. They found out you get locked up. They ain't going to be like, all right. That's what's happening back here. Good to go. 
We are locked up. You are privileged. This brother asks her, this is not in the vision. Brother asks her, um, pray to God. Pray to God to find out whether or not you're just going to be jailed or you're actually going to get to die. Like, I want to know, are you really going to get to die? That is awesome. Or are you just going to get jailed? Like, jail and release, that ain't good enough. I want to know whether you're going to be killed. This tells us something, again, about the Christian tradition, not only about the martyrdom piece, but because she's in jail, because that has already occurred, they believe she has, because of already going that step, she has access to the Holy Spirit to get some extra information. So just being persecuted to the point of being jailed means that you got closer access to the Holy Spirit than me who was outside. So you can say they expected to get a special measure of the Holy Spirit simply by being jailed. Yes. No, this this one was she was alive. This is a brother that was alive. The brother she's gonna meet in a vision a little bit later. So she has this vision. Her interpretation for the vision is she's going to die. Okay. The point is, even though she was going to die, she woke up from the vision and was incredibly happy that she was going to be put to death as a witness to Christ. There's several visits from her father while she is in jail, which tells us, first of all, family was given access to prisoners when they were in jail. It tells us something about the time, because he makes several visits. We know that she's pregnant because he says to her, First, spare me the pain, but spare your infant son. So either she's pregnant or she has a child. She has a child. That's yeah. Felicity that was pregnant, right? Felicity's yeah. pregnant. So Perpetua has a child, spare your son. There's one line that tells us something again that obviously was a way out for Christians. The father says, just make a sacrifice for the emperor's well-being. So in other words, the Christians, you had a way out. Your way out was, remember we said, you have all these traditional religious traditions. But if you, if you did what you had to do for Rome, the father is saying, look, if you just do this act for Rome, fine. do your Christian thing, fine. But do this act for Rome, you'll be spared. That tells us that there wasn't out for Christians. They did this sacrifice to Rome. If they did this sacrifice to the emperor, this one act, they would receive what was called certificates. And we get certificates saying, you literally can show your certificate. Oh, no, no, I did my Roman thing. Look. All right. Now you walk away, leave them alone. Now, the reason why this is pointed out here in the story, we would love to say that all Christians were faithful unto death. No, a lot of them was like, I'll do whatever I got to do to stay alive. Give me the certificate. So they would do the Roman right. I said Roman right. No. The Roman, (laughs) they would do the Roman ceremonial um, sacrifice to the Roman guys or to the Roman emperor and receive the certificate. So the fact that they put it in here and she said no, again, exemplifying, defining what actually is a witness. Okay. Yes. So if she did like a Roman thing, would she still be able to like be a practicing Christian? Well, okay. So that's funny. That's an interesting thing. Um, yes, but would it be accepted very shortly after? What I mean by that is, well, I'm saying shortly, but a century later, which we'll talk about next week, the Christian tradition goes from being persecuted to being the emperor's faith, right? Well, I shouldn't say that. Constantine did not become, 
constantly accepted Christianity, right? It goes from being the, the minority in the group to being the most powerful faith tradition in the empire. Once they became the most powerful in the empire, now they start asking questions. Okay, what about those people who took the certificate? Now there's a whole debate about, are they really Christian? Are they really with us? Even though it happened a long time ago, are they really in? So that question comes down the road. And we'll talk about that. They're called lapsed Christians because they were terrified, so they did the answer to Absolutely. This is more of a theological question than like a historical question, but like isn't there like a part of the Bible that says that the not at the expense of giving your worship to another god. Oh, that's fair. That's a good point. I didn't realize the Roman church was like. Oh no, it's it's yeah. We got to remember. Remember what I said. Worship is not a private matter. Anything yeah. you do with worship, you're signifying two things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure, a religious thing, but more importantly, a political thing. Right. So you're no longer putting faith in Christ. Who you putting faith in publicly? One other thing I want to mention that happens early on um, in the text by the editor makes a statement that this actually happens again when the animal that attacks Petro Felicity. It's, it's the significance of the animal that was used. It's very rare in any text to emphasize a feminine aspect to the text. But that's what happens here in, in Perpetual Felicity. Um, because it mentions that when she was sentenced to die by the wild beasts, um, she gave the baby up to the family, which tells us, first of all, the baby was in jail with her. All right. So then she gave the baby up once she was sentenced. And then God, it says, God made sure the baby no longer desired to nurse. And Perpetua said, and I didn't suffer any inflammation, so I wouldn't be burdened by anxiety for my son and pain in my breasts. I mean, it is an actual physical thing that happens, right? Um, no, I'm not going to tell that story. Oh, because I'm recording. <laughs> but let's just say, I, I, have, I, have, I have witnessed this with six kids when the baby cry, things happen, okay? <laughs> to, to the mother if, if she close, right? I mean, it, it, is a, it is a physical thing that takes place. They point out that God intervened to make sure that that wasn't the case for perpetual. The reason why that's significant, that kind of detail would not never, would almost do a double negative would never be present in a text back then. All right, so it was significant. The editor, if it was Tertullian or whoever the case would be, was purposely putting that in there to, I guess, the way I want to put it, is to ensure that this is comforting, not just to Christians in general, but almost in particular to Christian women. This is where I want to point out, it says specifically in the text, we know why Perpetua and the others were kind of what I called uh, uh, gathered up for these games. Remember how I said, the emperor doesn't normally do this, it's a local governor. With the local governor, his name was Hilarion. Hilarion. He basically, wanted to, for lack of a better term, kiss up to the emperor. So he came up with a gladiator games in celebration of the emperor's son's birthday. Okay. Son was turning 14. The fact that in this text, uh, Perpetual calls him Caesar Gita's birthday means that they expected him to be emperor. Somewhere. So really, Hillary is kissing up to a couple people both to the current emperor and for the emperor who, who the person who will someday be emperor. And as the gladiator games. The gladiator games ended with gladiators fighting. 
you know, it began with people being fighting animals. So if he's gonna have this huge event, he gotta come up with bodies for this event. How convenient that there's an edict out to arrest those who are converted. That's the reason why you have these Christians being jailed at this moment in time. He's preparing for this game. The expectation was the four slaves. What Hillary was not expecting was that one of them was gonna be a noble one. That don't look good, okay? So one of them wrapped up as a noble woman, which is the reason why you have so much insistence on her to recant. Ain't nobody asking the slaves to recant. They don't, no, y'all, y'all go. For the noble one, please do something. Are you sure that's what you want to do? All right. The person who continues to visit her and ask her to recant is her father. This is where I will say um, we don't know if this is a, is a literary device or if it was her father who was truly coming. This is what I mean. In the Roman world, say something that is, is uh, every time I say it, I hesitate because it's a painful part of human history. And I got two daughters, which is the reason why I hesitate every time I say it. But in the ancient world, particularly in the Roman world, women were property. For all intents and purposes, they did not, they had more rights than a woman who was not a Roman citizen, but they didn't really have any rights. The male in the family had all control over the woman, life or death. So for Perpetua, a noble woman, this is why it was weird to have a noble woman in this situation. Normally, her husband would step in and be like, okay, you ain't about to be no Christian. <laughs> you could be a Christian undercover, you can be a Christian around this house, but you ain't about to be a Christian where you about to go to jail. It's, they, they could not say anything about it. In this case, it's not her husband. It's her father, which is the reason why we say either her husband was locked up too, which means he did not have, he, he couldn't speak on her behalf because he was locked up too or her husband had passed away. There's a third option though. Remember I said early on that this was being written purposely for generations down the road. Christian communities down the road. In the Christian community, this idea of the father having a relationship with the one who was about to be uh, sacrificed carries a special connotation. So we don't know if it really was her father or if this is something the author, it's kind of something that they re-edited, re, you know, kind of redacted to speak to the Christian community. Because the father is clearly, clearly distraught at his daughter's situation. He visits her several times, all right? When he was at the house, I kind of call it another mic drop moment for Betua. When he says to her, you know, do you really want to do this Christian thing? She pointed at a cup and she said, what do you call that? He said, a cup. She said, would you call it anything else? He said, no, it's a cup. Then don't call me anything else. I'm a Christian. Mic drop. That's bad. That's bad. Okay. <laughs> but then later on, the father comes. It says that he's pulling his hair out of his face. Now, I got a beard. All y'all fellas here with a beard. Could you pull... Could you even, I don't care how hard you are, could you pull your hair out your face? It hurt, okay, it hurt. So that's how distraught he is. He's laying on the ground, he's ripping his clothes. He's a noble man who is not acting very nobly. Is that a word? Okay, he's not acting very nobly, right? Because he is so distraught. This is the point. As a Roman father, he would have the authority to just do it. This is why I think there's some literal, or there's some literary, um, this, this is a device here. The father has the power and he obviously loves her, but he still gives her the choice. Ultimately, it's still her decision. You see how if it's a Christian community, you, you, you kind of 
are, are you would be sent, you, you would be extra sensitive to that interchange between the father and the one who is choosing to give up their life. The freedom is that important, even to the father. So he's hurting because she's losing, he says she's about to lose her, but he doesn't want to take away that autonomy from her. It also demonstrates that Christian values supersede any allegiance that you have to family. I want to move up to just before they are finally marched to the arena. It mentions there that the military, once he has all these Christians um, in prison, they beef up the military. They get a little bit harsher with the punish with the enforcement, punishment. It's because they were concerned about some kind of magic spells. This tells us more than likely, even those who were unbelievers knew some of the stories in the Gospels of the apostles who what would appear to them magically were freed when they were in prison. So they knew these stories and they're like, that ain't about to happen to us. Uh, they, they genuinely were afraid of these magical spells. There's a time where Perpetua speaks up for the group. They're getting ready to go out to the beasts, but they look like they've been in prison. And so she says, can, you know, can, we, can we get cleaned up first? <laughs> and the commander's like, shut the hell up. You, you're about to go out to the animals. But <laughs> what are you talking about? And she says, I can't believe I just said that. I'm recording this. Um, <laughs> she said, Aren't we important enough to your emperor to be clean before we're in front of him? She said, and I said it calmly. Apparently, she said it was so much force. It says in there that the commander got horrified, scared, which is a couple of things. First of all, she probably said it kind of strong. She's a noble. Remember, she's a noble woman. Okay, she said it pretty strong. And remember, they scared of magical spells. That tells you. There was a level of fear, respectful fear, for the Christian community. So even the Roman soldiers are like, okay, they, they are about to go out to wild beasts and they're concerned about how they look. And she's talking real strong. That, that can scare you. I mean, that can, again, I know I like to use football, art, football, sports illustrations. My son plays for St. Edwards. In Cleveland. Anybody know about St. Edwards in Cleveland? Football powerhouse, right? He's not from Cleveland. He went there just to go to school there. He said, Dad, it's not even fair. I said, what you mean it's not fair? He said, we literally come out. He plays defensive end. He lines up on defensive end, and he says, he, he said, I'm not just saying it. The other team looks scared. Like, their eyes is like, shh. It's the same thing. So they've already defeated themselves because they're it's the reputation of what St. Edwards is, right? I mean, granted, they snarling and grabbing grass, throwing and doing all kinds of crazy stuff to get in the mind. But the point is, they got a reputation behind it. That's what the Christians have here, right? They got, the, they got these stories about the people that we got kicked, you know. It's, it's, it's some weird stuff. Some weird stuff going on. And they talking strong. You can hear the animals, and they talking strong. 
right? So they they were horrified. They're, so that tells us something about even the local community had a respect for the Christian community. One of the um, satirists actually said, or was asked, why are you so eager to gawk at those who hate you? As they were getting ready to go down, people were heckling them. All right. Um, one of the things that he looked forward to because of what they were saying was saying they would be washed in blood. Saturnus looked forward to this. It tells us something again about this theology of martyrdom. Just as baptism was a um, act that symbolized their allegiance, their, I don't know if that said, yeah, their allegiance to Christ, they looked forward to being baptized in blood. So it's another baptism. That's what they looked at their martyrdom as. Another baptism, which was a act to publicly, without question, identify their allegiance to Christ, to be a witness of God's grace. So ironically, you got to think about how weird it would have been back then. But even, I mean, there's a certain virtue of fortitude now. The closer they're getting to their death, the more they feel they are in victory. Even though everything on the outside is saying, no, you... It's about to end all bad, all bad. <laughs> they are saying, no, this is all good. This is all good. Yes? I was going to say, is that where, like, I mean, now we can think about the way that that scene has worn out. Because I actually got to see where it started that. It's exactly where it started. So you, you have these seeds. What Marissa is referring to there. So in the Christian tradition, you have the sacrament of baptism, which just as then, I mean, granted, there's some sacramental things happening, but it's an, it is a, it is an act that people can see, right? That it is a act that is identifying you with the church. Generally speaking, in usual circumstances, water baptism is the only, is the sacrament that initiates you into the church, not fully, but begins your initiation into the church. However, there are two exceptions to it. One of them is called baptism by blood. A little bit different than here, because baptism by blood meant somebody actually had to, had to, had to uh, this, this whole, all these things here. Right? But baptism by blood would mean that you are in the process of conversion, which means you are in the RCIA, whatever the catechesis is. Right? You're, you're moving through the process. But you live in an area where Christianity is a minority. You live in an area where Christianity is, has to be underground. You live in an area where Christians had the potential of being attacked and you die because of your known association with the Christian community. That's baptism by fire. In other words, something got in the way between you and the baptismal font, that being that you were killed. That is not necessarily a martyr but it is baptism by blood, right? which means you are recognized as a member of the church, even though you didn't make it to the baptismal font. The other is called baptism by desire, which means the same thing. You are in the process. You're in the in uh, your catechumen or candidate. You're in the process of joining the church. However, an unforeseen occurrence, let's say you got in a car accident and you unfortunately passed away, or you're coming into the faith and you had a medical condition that you didn't know of and you passed away. It's baptism by desire, meaning that you would have funeral mass, it would be expected um, and hoped that you would be in communion with the Lord, and they would have, you know, like I said, mass at your funeral, um, even though you were not baptized. That is a modern development of something that was planted back then. Good catch. Let's end class with probably 
to them would have been the most glorified part of this whole thing, but for us, it will be the most morbid, and that is their actual deaths. I want to talk about, even though I'm doing this backwards, I want to talk about satirists first. Satirist was matched up with a leopard. He had to fight a leopard. Um, it says that he was bald by a leopard. However, let me tell you, okay, no, I'm just gonna tell you something. If it's me, and you put me in somewhere with a leopard, I ain't coming out. It's just not, it's, just, it's over, it's a wrap. Okay, <laughs> I ain't fighting no leopard. It's, it's, I'm dead. That's, that's all it's to it. Satyrus was bitten by the leopard and lived. So he had to be brought back out to be killed by execution. He was like, dang, the leopard didn't do it. <laughs> he was upset. Stupid leopard. You thought that was my time. That was my moment. Leopard didn't do it. Um, he lived, I mean, he, he, so he was drugged to one part of the arena and then brought back out at a later time uh, to be executed. However, he was so at peace because it was now he knew he was going to be executed. It says here in the text that he didn't make a sign. And he was ran through. He was, he was, he actually felt relief because he reached that level of witness. Perpetual and Felicity, this again, now I don't know, we don't know whether or not this is the actual animal that they were mauled by or if this is a literary device, we don't know. But did anybody catch what animal, surprisingly, the animal they were mauled by? Anybody catch it? Was it a bull? It was a cow, a very fierce cow, gored by a cow. Now, I don't know how many of y'all have been around cows, but normally a cow, not a bull. We're not talking about a bull. <laughs> We're talking about a cow. Normally, you know, don't, you don't want them to sit on you, all right? But you can tip a cow. You can literally tip a cow. Now, I have not done it. <laughs> But I got buddies in the military who grew up in rural areas. They swear it's the funnest thing in the world. I'm not going to try. I just, I don't mess with wild animals like that. I mean, I know they're domesticated, but to me, that's wild. If I can't put it in my house, it's wild. Okay. <laughs> so I'm not messing with an animal like that. But the point is, you can tip one. Okay. You can sneak up on one and actually tip it over, which I guess is cruel. I don't know. Is it hard for them to get up? I don't, I don't know. But anyway. <laughs> oh, mm, see. That's more information right there than I probably need to know, but that's okay. <laughs> anyway, anyway, the point is, I, it, it's again, it, it's you have a, a cow which produces milk, right? Attacking two women, one who had a young son, and we already talked about that, and the other who just had a child. Which, by the way, I didn't bring this up. Felicity, what was one of her words while she was like that? Anybody catch that? And if she didn't give birth, would they let her? No. So she was worried. She was like, hurry up, I got to have this baby. So I can get out there and die. That tells no, I'm not, I'm not twisting my face because, I, listen, I'm not making fun of you. I'm simply saying, that's how strong this theology of martyrdom was. Hurry up, let me have this baby so I can be out there with my friends and die. Did anyone notice when Perpetua was hit, the first thing she did when she stood up after the first initial attack by the cow? Okay. She fixed her hair and her dress. She stood up, got herself together. She was like, nope, mm -mm, I'm not going out like this. I'm, I'm, I'm looking good. Now, How many have ever, this is all serious, have been in a trauma situation where persons do something that you, that you were not expecting to do? When I was, 
You guys been? I was in when I was in the military. I was driving a Humvee in Croatia, and I was in the beginning of a convoy. As we came around the corner, a round came through the front windshield and shot my warrant officer who was sitting right next to me. I mean, bang, his head went back. I didn't even turn my head because I'm like, and then I hear him talking. He's telling me, hurry up, hit the gas, do this, do that. He's yelling up to the guy, radio this, radio that. Now, I'm driving and I'm like, I got to see. Got to look. I look. I'm not, not y'all, I'm not playing. His hope, his eye was, was I'm talking, when I say gone, was gone. Gone. And I'm like, <laughs> so we drive. I'm laughing now, but it was not, at the time my heart was bumping, I'm like, this is it. This, about, this, is about, this dude is a walking dead right now. He about to bite me. It's about to, it's about to all be over. Because he looked bad. We get to the, we get to the um, rallying point. He gets out. Dip still in his mouth. I'm then walking around. He walks up to the corpsman and says, fix me. Fix me. The corpsman is looking at him like, I mean, you know the way you don't want a doctor to look. You show up and you're like, I got something wrong. He's like, oh, I don't know what to do. That's literally what the corpsman was looking at. Like, oh, dude, how are you walking right now? Right? So the point is this. We don't know whether or not it was really the spirit that just had her composed because sometimes you can get in a situation where you just do some stuff you you don't she cleaned herself oh, that one was good she in an arena with animals running around right so we don't know what what that was about but the point is it's repeated in here to, yeah, to um <laughs> that threw me off that's <laughs> so I just that threw me off to emphasize how spirit field that she was we may have modern, we may have modern explanations as to why she did what she did. But the point is, it was written down there to show how prepared she was. Perpetua as well survived the attack. All of them had to be brought back out and then executed. All of them gave their lives as a testimony to Christ. All right, and the story has continued to be told, continuing this theology of martyrdom, which started in the second century and still has some weight to it today. Friday, you will be reading about Polycarp, which is before Perpetual and Felicity. Actually, Polycarp was a disciple of St. John. So we're going to learn about Polycarp, and I'm going to pull out some theology that has come out of his martyrdom, how it connects today. And then read about the exhortation to Origin. It's going to be our first introduction to Origin. We'll be reading Origin um, later on, I think next week as well.